Hello there and welcome to Complete Games with me, James, and this is the Explorer Note read-through for the graduate students on Aberration. Now this will be the final episode to cover all the lore from the Aberration map, and it'll be a longer episode as we're going to be going over all six of the survivors' notes. I also wanted to read you some of the questions and answers put forward to the author Mark Solsic that I found on the ARC Community Reddit lore section at the end of this read-through. And interesting that he points out he wrote all of the lore for the first four maps, but states that Cedric, who's the lead community manager for ARC, wrote the first draft of the graduate student notes. Now I say interesting because as I read these notes I noticed a change in style not only in the narrative but in how each of the modern day students chose to write their notes. It feels more like a screenplay or a scripted cutscene from a horror movie. And when you take these notes aside I think it's very clear that somebody else wrote them. I do think it's much better to keep the story of all six students in one episode as well because it's told in a relay style with each student taking over the story from where the last one left off. So to break this into two episodes or even give each of the students their own episode I think would be a lot harder to digest. The events of the graduate students on Aberration take place an indetermined amount of time after the main survivors left through the Gateway Project. So sit back, relax and enjoy notes 1 to 30 of the graduate students on Aberration. Well, we ain't in Kentucky no more, I can tell you that. Never heard of a cave this big, and sure as hell ain't heard of no glowing rocks. Even Uncle Chester'd be punching himself if he could see this, and he thinks a tribe of mutant squirrels runs the government. Good news, I ain't in this boat alone. Bad news, I'm sharing it with a bunch of know-it-all city boys and one quiet city girl. Maybe they know what's what in a classroom, but they're all wet behind the ears when it comes to real survival. Men versus nature and all that. Looks like it'll be up to me to save the day then. Like my puppy always said, if you want a cat skinned right, do it your damn self. One of these days, I'm going to knock Trent's flipping jaw right back into Jersey. Boy thinks the sun comes up just to hear him crow. Not that the sun rises regularly around here. But you'll get the point. And DMU, don't know why everyone listens to him. I'm the one putting food on the table. Back home, if we didn't hunt, we didn't eat. So I just made myself a bow and went to work. Nothing to it. At least Amelia's helped me make some tools. She's timid as a mouse, but sharp as those picks we fashioned. They ought to help us get past these rocks as well. Ain't too sure about giving one to that rusty fella, Boris. But like my cousin Otis always said, keep your enemies close and a gun closer. Hell yeah, I bagged him. So there I was, stalking through the brush like a lion or a bear or a bear lion. Anyway, we'd come up over that rock wall a while back, so I figured I'd rustle up some supper. That's when I saw him. The biggest damn rat to ever live. I mean, this fella was so huge, his footsteps sounded like he turned the ground into a drum. But I caught him dead in the eye. Rat meat ain't exactly a T-bone steak, but it'll feed us for days. Bet this gets everyone kissing my boots like they're covered in honey. Even a mew. Like my great aunt Bessie always said, respect ain't given, it's eaten. It ain't right. I killed that varmint that pretty boy Trent was stuffing his face with and he's still got the stones to laugh at me just because I stumbled over my words again. So what if I can't talk like EMU? What's Trent done? Earned some trophies playing pig scheme back home. I've been keeping us alive. Still shouldn't have made a fuss over it. Boris had to hold me back or else I'd have... And now, Trent's avoiding me. EMU's scolding me and Amelia's too scared to even look at me. It's like my second cousin twice remove Ernest always said. If you lose your temper, you'd best be sure to find it because tempers are mighty expensive. I can't stand it no more. They think I don't hear all the whispering about how I ain't stable, how I can't be trusted. Well fine, these new caves are even stranger than before, with all the glowing and whatnot. And I bet they've got even nastier critters lurking about. If I can bag myself one of those, they'll realize I'm as trustworthy as the day is long. Maybe Amelia will even speak to me again. Like my ancestor, the great pioneer Floyd William Stafford III always said, the only way a man can be a man is if he's man enough to know when it's time to be a man. And right now, 
it's time for Rusty Stafford to be a man. Oh, Rusty, you idiot. If I ever get the chance to return this journal, I want you to know that we always trusted you. We were just worried about the pressure you put on yourself. Even Trent misses you, despite all that stupid alpha male chest thumping. Boris is the real jerk here. Everyone else just wants to look for you, but he keeps insisting that it's not worth it. How can he be so heartless? He's like a robot or something. He hardly even seems frightened by this place. I wish I could say the same. I feel trapped in this nightmare and each day it gets worse. Please be out there, Rusty. We need to stick together to find a way home. God, I just want to go home. How did Trent and Emu stay so motivated? The other day, we built a series of zip lines to help us get around and it felt like they did all the heavy lifting, even though I'm an engineering student. Compared to them, I've done next to nothing since Rusty disappeared. I wake up with every sound, afraid that these wolf creatures we spotted might tear through our makeshift shelter and devour us. It's all I can think about, all the different ways we could die and all the ways it'd be my fault. Ugh. Being such a burden on everyone is the grossest feeling ever, so why can't I do anything about it? I'm still not sure how he did it, but EMU turned one of those nasty wolf bat things into a pet. It even lets him ride on his back, and it can climb across the zip lines we set up. I think that it made everyone a little bit more confident, so we decided to range out further in search of Rusty. Unfortunately, we found him. Poor Rusty. The first thing we spotted was a bloody shirt, and then... I can't describe the rest. Just thinking about it makes me want to puke again. Boris thinks whatever got him might still be in the area, but I don't think I have the strength to keep moving. After today, this all seems so hopeless. We're all going to die here. What did I do to deserve this hell? I tried to be a good student, a good friend, a good sister. What did I do? Those vicious little demons are still below us, waiting to rip us apart, just like Emu's pet. We managed to run to the cavern wall and climb up to this alcove using our picks. But now we're trapped. This is it. This is where we die. Boris yelled at me after we escaped and said I'm the one to blame. He's probably right. We hadn't moved that far from where Rusty was because I was too tired. And we didn't find a better place to hide because I was too scared and too slow. I've killed us. God help me, I've killed all of us. I've never been brave or adventurous. I was that kid who always coloured between the lines and followed every rule. No matter how arbitrary, no risks, no mistakes, just good grades and a forgettable face. I'm still not brave, but I won't die like this. I won't let this gross, trembling wretch be the last vision of me to draw breath. Maybe I've been worthless to this group in life, like Boris says, but my death won't be. Once I finish this entry, I'm going to stuff this notebook into the first pack I see and tell everyone to make a break for it while I lure those things away. I probably won't make it very far, but if you're reading this, then I guess it was enough. Goodbye. I'm sorry. The pawn sacrifices itself to defend the king. At least Amelia Muller realised that in the end. That is all that can be said for her. The others think me callous, but this is simply the way of things. Even here amongst the demons these rules apply. For example, the largest of the pack that slew Amelia summoned and commanded its lesser brethren. However, I do not think that was a king. No, it serves something grander. I could feel its bond. The same bond that I felt with this strange metal that inhabits these caves. It's almost like a melody of some kind. A siren song drifting up from the depths, down where the true king lies. I intend to find him. Though our number was once five, only two of us have ever mattered. Only Amu and I possess the strength of will and presence of mind to discover this place's secrets. If he can discard his inner weakness, perhaps we might find it together. If he cannot, then in the end it will come to blood. The more he wastes his time comforting that brainless mule Trent, the more I fear it will be the latter. A shame, but I will do what I must. The deeper we delve, the stronger I hear the call. Am I destined to answer it? This labyrinth is mine to conquer. Of nothing else have I been so certain. 
When I called this place a labyrinth, it had occurred to me that eventually I would have to face its minotaur. Though I had not expected that day to come so soon. It was a towering, savage hellspawn, with wicked claws and a tail like a great spiny serpent. We were fending off another pack of those hairless demons when it burst from the ground, roaring and hissing. Needless to say, we immediately fled. Yet fortune is often born of chaos. In our haste, we lost our sense of direction, and I stumbled on something wondrous. A glowing metal artifact, unlike anything I've ever seen. If these caverns are a labyrinth from that alien creature, the Minotaur, then surely this is its treasure. Yes, I understand now. All of this is by design. This place, these creatures, our arrival, he orchestrated it all as a test. The artifact isn't a prize, it's simply a token, proof that I am worthy and it is the key that will unlock the path below, and at its end I will find the king, there I will find the master. Although if this is a key, then where is the door? That terminal we passed earlier, yes, that must be it. I need only to convince the others to head in that direction and then, it is as I said before, sacrifices must be made. That is the way of things. That is the way of the master. I said I was willing to die and that appears to be the natural course of action. On my way back from the terminal I was attacked by a pack of ravengers and neglectically injured. Ah, I was so foolish to try and rush back. My injuries are far too severe to make it back to the camp in good health. When we were scouting locations for a camp, we were malnourished, in a state of clumsiness. Rusty slipped and fell a great distance off the edge of a cliff. He pleaded with me to carry him, but I knew this wasn't a reasonable request. It would have been foolish to let his body go to waste. Now, I have the same fate, although it won't be a waste. It seems I've found a clue to unlocking the terminals, an artifact. Trent and Emil must continue where I have failed, unlocking the key to existence. Not so dumb now, am I, Boris? Hope you felt real smart while you were bleeding out, bro. Emu still thinks he could have talked the psycho down, but I say screw him. The dude attacked Emu out of nowhere and then ran off into this weird ass room. He completely lost it. Crazy or not, though, he may have been onto something. Emu says this place Boris found might be related to the glowy thing he was constantly staring at. Something about a series of keys? I don't know. I let Emu do the talking. I'm the big handsome muscle in this operation, you know. Hey, writing all this down actually feels pretty good. I think I'll do it more often. At least when our mule doesn't need to study Boris's notes. Coach always said that the key to be a good running back is following your blockers. My bro mule here, he's like my lead blocker. A real stud fullback. Sticking with him's the only reason any of us made it past day one in this place, man. He's got all this shit figured out. If we find the rest of these alien artifact whatevers, that terminal Boris found, we'll open a door and we ought to be out of here. Don't know how he knows all that. Dude's just a straight genius. We're going to start by checking out those buildings I spotted this afternoon. At least they look like buildings. But who would have built them? No way anyone would live in this batshit crazy place. Holy crap. I have a laser gun. An actual real ass pew pew laser gun. Okay, okay, so check this out. Turns out that there was way more of those buildings than we thought. Like a small town's worth. Whoever actually used them was long gone way before we got there. But they left behind a ton of sweet gear. There's even these crazy space beds that helped him mule heal his wounds he got from Boris. Wish Amelia was here to help figure out how this stuff works. Well anyway, we're going to use this place as our new home base while we go searching for these artifacts. Between Emu's pets and these badass new guns, Things are finally looking up. So far so good. We're making tons of progress on these artifacts and I've been feeling extra pumped lately. I think all my hype is even rubbing off on a muir. The other day we spent like an hour joking about who's going to play us when we sell our story to Hollywood. Haven't seen him that chill since before we lost Rusty. Pretty soon we're going to head deeper than we've ever been to find the last of the artifacts. It won't be a tropical vacation or anything. But our teamwork is on point right now, so bring it on. The lasers help too. Teamwork and freaking lasers, baby. Screw these big ass alien things, bro. Like the giant claws and teeth ain't enough. Apparently they can stab you with their tail too. 
That's such bullshit. I could have totally taken it on if we hadn't cheated like that. Easy. We were able to get away before it did anything worse at least. And Emil says my wound isn't too bad. There was no poison either. So why do I feel like I ate the most questionable burrito of all time? I mean, damn, this really hurts. It feels like my stomach is trying to jump out of my skin. Hopefully I can sleep it off. Where five once stood, one remains. Trent is dead and I am alone. By the time I killed that devil that tore its way out of his body, his hazard suit had been reduced to rags. It was hard to bear. Even before arriving in this place, I had seen the cost of war. But I am not like Boris or the soldiers that guarded my family's estate. I cannot look into the face of death with cold and wavering eyes. Yet even in this darkest hour, I must push onward. For the sake of my fallen comrades, I will endure. However long the night, the dawn will break and I intend to see it. Boris's notes remind me of those who still practice Vudon in my homeland. The master he speaks of is like a spirit of this land, and these artifacts are the talismans or fetishes. Perhaps these were the delusional scrawlings of a madman, but I cannot dismiss them. Despite his betrayal, Boris was no fool. I do feel something when we look at the two artifacts we discovered. It is most likely simply nervousness, for I am unused to carrying such burdens alone. My parents believed that the royal hand should be free of calluses, so I always relied on the servants for everything, right up until the moment I snuck off to college. I don't think I could ever return to that life, not after all I've seen. Trent, my friend, your sacrifice was not in vain. At long last I have found the third artifact we sought. It took many failed expeditions, but to get lost is to learn the way, and for every wrong turn I mapped a new part of these caverns, and now I know them as well as I know myself. I will gather my creatures and head for the terminal in the morning. If Boris's notes were right, these artifacts should be able to activate it. I'm not sure what will happen after that, but it cannot be worse than the fate that awaits me here. If only the others were alive to see this day. If only I'd been able to save them too. Now that I've gathered all three artifacts together, as I travel to the terminal I feel a pull in my mind. No, a whisper. If this is what Boris was speaking of, and he wasn't mad after all. There is a voice here. There is a master. What is it? A spirit? A god or some alien force? Whatever it is, its presence is heavy. Though I am well rested, every time I hear it, I grow tired. My pets feel it too, and even they know enough to be afraid. My hands are shaking as I write this. Only the memory of those who died for this moment pushes me forward. Rusty, Amelia, Boris and Trent, lend me your strength. Let us face this final challenge together. Abandon hope. Do not seek the master. No one could prepare for his limitless power. No one could fathom his terrible majesty. I've been a fool this whole time. All of us. We were nothing but fools. We never had a chance of surviving this terrible place. Only death awaited us in the end. Only him. This is a prison with no exit. It is an endless hell. There is no escape from the master. There is no escape from Rockwell. Far out. This place is kind of like a dream I had. So it went like this. I ride some tram thing like the biggest weirdest zoo in the universe, right? Only instead of animals, there's dinosaurs. Totally cool. Until they escape and just like in every horror movie ever made. Duh. Anyway. Dream Me hops into a truck with some ripped badass dudes and we start driving around shooting dinosaurs and stuff and I felt like a legit action hero. So I guess this place isn't exactly the same, there's dinosaurs, but I don't get to have guns or a truck. Also I'm completely alone, but it's still just a dream right? I mean, obviously, I don't even know why I'm writing this down, it's all in my head. All I need to do is walk off that cliff and I'll wake up right before I hit the ground. And that concludes all of the graduate student notes on aberration. And before we wrap this one up, as I said at the start, I just wanted to go over some of the comments that Mark Solskin, the writer who bought us the Explorer notes, said in a bit of a Q and A on Reddit. 
So I'm just going to pick some of the comments that more relate to aberration questions and answers, but I will leave a link down below if anyone's interested in reading all of the questions from the writer. It was quite interesting. So the original number one asks, since the arcs were built by humans for humans to survive and thrive until the corruption was undone, why did the intelligence running the arcs destroy any humans that learned to survive and thrive? Had the corruption spread through the arcs intelligence before they had launched? And Mark replied with this, for a couple of reasons. First, while the primary goal of the arcs was to restore Earth, they'd got a secondary goal of collecting data from the survivors using it to further their primary goal. So as Helena suspects, the individual arcs are also running their own contained experiments. Destroying any major civilizations is basically resetting the experiment. And second, the problem with humans thriving too prosperously on the arcs is that it would, in the eyes of the creators, breed complacence. And in the worst case, it would lead to a situation like the Gateway Project, where the humans try to escape too early and throw the whole ARC system out of balance. That's what Rhea is implying when she tells Helena the ARCs won't allow anyone to master them. And here's another one that Beefus Sutherland asked, was the presence of element on the ARCs intended by the creators? Would that be a bit counterproductive? Were the arcs and the cloning thing something humans were already working on prior to the corruption, or did they have to create all of the rest first when it became clear that they were f***ed? Why do the buildings in the city on extinction have no door? How do people get inside? And are you coming back to play a role in writing of Genesis 2? And Mark replied with this, there are a few reasons for the existence on the Ark, but mainly it was necessary to prepare for humans for a potential presence on Earth and give the arcs data on the enemy such as it was like running a combat simulation for preparations for a battle. In the event the arcs did not completely 100% wipe out the infection, or if more element appeared, humans would need to know how to deal with it, and this could give them the data to do so. However, it was only meant to be included in small doses. Its abundance in aberration was a result of malfunctioning systems. It's never really stated outright, but I imagine cloning would be very far along by the time of the URE and the Federation. The arcs were a Hail Mary attempt at saving the planet that only went underway when things went south. That's a matter of game development particularly more than anything. It would be better to question the level designers, but I imagine it's so the players didn't think they could get inside somehow. I've moved on from writing the arc. Extinction was the end of the saga for me. However, the idea of the colony ship and arc prime, which are linked, was something I left behind for Wildcard to use in the future, if they so desired. Here's another question about Aberration. There might not be any real reason to answer this, but what was Aberration like prior to Rockwell corrupting it? I've seen some posts where people theorise that Aberration used to be another arc, the island Val Guerrero, Ragnarok, etc., and only became a giant cave system after the corruption. But is there any validity to this? Assuming there isn't, was it always meant to be a huge cave system with small but habitable surface? Or was it mostly like a surface map with some caves in it like the other maps? With the existence of Reapers and Drakes always intended in some form, did Rockwell create them? Were they scrapped ideas that were in the Ark's data but never meant to spawn until Rockwell took control? During the cutscene after the Overseer fight on the island, you see a ton of the Ark's orbiting around the Earth. You seem to be able to see another island and a Scorch close by. Is it implied that there are only a few variations of the Ark's that are used multiple times? If so, does it mean that there are other aberration Ark's that are still in their proper state? You can see in Diana's note that Aberration had a thriving surface similar to the island. She mentions blue skies, wilderness, dinosaur wildlife. The caves always existed in some form, as made evident by Diana, Santiago and friends escaping into them, but they changed rapidly following the malfunction. How much? I'd leave that up to your interpretation. Reapers and Drakes appear in Mei Ying and Diana's notes, so Rockwell couldn't have created them. Though he can control Reapers due to their strong ties to Element, the arcs in general were starting to produce more dangerous creatures because of how long they've been in orbit. As the one who waits alludes to, and the aberrations conditions would naturally make that worse. That I can't say, since there's no official word on it. Personally I would say what's on those arcs could be anything. Maybe it's a second island, maybe something entirely different. Let your imagination run wild. So that about wraps up all of the aberration note read through and I thought it would be interesting at the end there if we did go over a couple of the author's notes. Of course comments down below, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what you thought about the students there. When all said and done, the story and the line of the students is something extra that was added into aberration. 
Don't forget to subscribe if you're new here and you'd like to see some more art content from myself. But until next time, I'm James from Complete Games and I'll see you.